As the controversy surrounding the introduction of 15% national automobile cancel levy on imported vehicles lingers, some maritime lawyers have demanded court intervention as a way of resolving their matter. Now, the Nigerian Customs Service had recently introduced a 15% NAC levy on used imported vehicles, a decision which didn't go down well with clearing agents in the country's maritime sector. The agents have argued that the NAC levy is mostly meant for new vehicles, questioning the rationale behind the introduction of the duty on used vehicles. In a quick response, the service in a statement by the National Public Relations Officer, Timi Mbomodi, said the move was in compliance with the Economic Community of West Africa Common External Tariff. Well, that's our focus on the show for today. Welcome to Business Insight and Plus TV Africa. I am Justin Akadoni. Before we get to the main discourse, let's bring you a highlight of major business stories which trended this week. Take a look. Telecommunication subscribers under the aegis of the National Association of Telecom Subscribers have said they are set to drag the federal government to court in May in a bid to temporarily suspend the government's barring of subscribers' outgoing calls. On Monday, April 4th, the federal government ordered telecom companies to bar outgoing calls on all lines that have yet to link their national identification number and the subscriber identity model. As a result of this, about 72.77 million active telecom subscribers were barred from making calls on their SIMs. In response to this, NATCARMS urged the federal government to extend the implementation of the SIM NIN policy by three months. The association also gave the government one month to implement the ban. As controversy continues to surround the introduction of 15% National Automobile Commission levy imposed on imported used vehicles by the Nigeria Customs Service, car dealers have threatened to close their stores this week. The NCS had recently introduced a 15% National Automobile Commission levy on used imported vehicles, a decision which didn't go down well with clearing agents in the country's maritime sector. The agents argue that the NAC levy is mostly meant for new vehicles, questioning the rationale behind the introduction of the duty on used vehicles. In a quick response, the service, in a statement by the National Public Relations Officer, Timmy Bomodi, said the move was in compliance with the economic community of West African Common External Tariff. The World Bank says increasing fuel subsidy puts the Nigerian economy at a high risk as subsidy payments could significantly impact public finance and pose debt sustainability concerns. The Washington-based lender said this in a new biannual report known as Africa's Pulse. According to the bank, Nigeria is projected to have a 3.8% growth in 2022, adding that as an oil-dependent country, weak oil production hampers economic recovery. It added that increasing fuel subsidy poses a high risk to the country's economic growth despite the increase in oil prices. The National Bureau of Statistics, NBS, says about 30 million passengers traveled through Nigerian airport in 2021. The figure represents a growth rate of 43.41% from 9 million recorded in 2020. The NBS disclosed this in its recent air transportation report for 2021, released on Wednesday. According to the report, the total number of arrivals in 2021 stood at 6.5 million, which was higher compared to the 4.9 million recorded in 2020. And those were the stories that made headlights in the world of business for this week. Now, partner and co-founder VIM Professional Solutions and, of course, the MD of Umwahi Associate, Magnus Mwongu, joined us now to share insight on this issue. Thanks for joining us, Magnus. Thank you very much. All right. Now, maritime stakeholders, especially clearing agents, have described the new policy as an illegality, explaining that it contravenes the nation's Finance Act. What does the Finance Act say about this? 
So one of the things we've also done as a business on this side is that we've monitored the Finance Act over the last three years. I mean, the first Finance Act was released, was made available in public in 2020, um, which is the Finance Act 2019. And from 2020 to date, we've had um, yearly editions of the Finance Act. And I dare say, uh, I haven't reviewed all of this act. Um, there's nothing that talks about clearly this um, National Automobile Commission levy. So it's a, it's a big, it's a lot of controversy at, at, at the time. And we probably need to be calling out on the Minister of Finance to give a proper clarification on what this implies. But chances are that there might be some publication or some notification by the government in connection, in partnership with the Nigerian Customs Service to issue such a um, um, legislation, but it's not contained in any of the Finance Act that has recently uh, made news. So we're looking at the 2020, which is the Finance Act 2019, we're looking at the 2021, which is the Finance Act 2020, and the very recent one, which is 2022, the Finance Act 2021. There is nothing in any of those acts that talks about National Automobile Commission levy of 15%. So those are, those are my views um, as the MD of whom I associate. But, um, and I know governments a couple of times bring in certain legislations to mitigate or manage the buying attitudes of, of its citizenry. So chances are that this is one of such things. So if the if the um, lawyers, the barristers in the automobile industry are saying that this contravenes the Finance Act, then maybe this gives credence to their position. Uh, let's take this one step further now, uh, Magnus. Uh, the clearing agents and dealers have argued that the NAC levy is an attempt by customs to arm twist importers in order to meet their yearly revenue target of 3 trillion naira for the year 2022. What do you make of this? So if, if anything we've said before is something to hold, hold water with and the various societies and groups and organizations that are coming up to challenge the position of this levy is something to hold on to. Then there may be there may be a smoke somewhere there to say perhaps because government is also trying to increase um, its internally generated revenue. They are also looking at ways of trying to get such funds because, like you know, um, importation of vehicles is, is also a key factor in this part in this part of the world. So chances are that the clearing agents may may have some smoke that they are stoking in that regard. All right. Uh, now, the stakeholders are also arguing that the NAC levy was supposed to be on collected... Let me take that question again. Sorry. Now, the stakeholders have argued that the NAC levy was supposed to be collected on new vehicle imports at 35% to encourage low vehicle or local vehicle manufacturers and industries in the country. Can you break this down for us? So what we have currently is for the importation of new vehicles, depending on the age of the new vehicle and then depending on the, on the make, there is a levy for it for new vehicles. There's a given levy that you have to pay. Then, in addition with the um, um, national, with the automotive um, levy, NAC levy. But for used vehicle, um, there's a 20% um, custom duty you need to pay. And in addition, with the 15% levy. So, the client agents are arguing that a combined 35% of this levy on used vehicle, will, will, it, it's too much, considering all of the econ economic effects going on in the country at the moment. Okay, so just what, uh, in other ways now, let's look at uh, this critically, just uh, what is the implication of um, this new development on Nigerians? So the implication is that we, be we begin to see a lot more increase in vehicle. As someone who is also involved in the importation of um, used vehicle into the country and, um, you know, um, knock down vehicles by way of parts, um, cost of buying these vehicles have increased. Because, of course, you know, the FX has a lot to play in this industry as well. So your cost, you bring in your vehicles, you bring in your goods into Nigeria, you sell in, you sell in Naira, and by the time you sell, you need to convert that fund back to US dollar to be able to, or, or foreign currency to be able to import, um, you know, these vehicles into the, into the country. 
So you begin to see certain bottlenecks along the way. So there is the FX one, there is the increase in, in um, duties that you need to pay, which is now you know put at 35%, except if the customs and the Ministry of Finance tend to reduce that. What we tend to see is that the cost of vehicles are going to go up, cost of transportation are going to go up, and it's going to have multiplier effect down the road. So even if you don't have a very and you need to go show up at a client meeting looking looking to you probably will be ordering an Uber or, or a boat service or any of those other um, types of um, transportation. The cost of buying those vehicles to put in that line of business is going to go up. And for the owners of those business to be cool, they are going to have to pass pass on that bulk um, to, to the ultimate consumer. So what we see play out in the next couple of months or into the into into a 12 month period, which is one year is that the cost of buying vehicles, cost of transportation, cost of going from one place to another is going to go up. Okay, fine. There's a whole lot of talk that has um, surrounded this new development. But uh, do you agree that by slamming this 15% uh, uh, NAC levy, the government was simply forcing people to tilt towards patronizing local manufacturers? Well, the... the the school of thought would argue that how many local manufacturers do we have and how durable are those vehicles? Do you want to do you want to spend about 10 million naira buying a vehicle and in two or three years down the line you're looking like you've not even start, started up anything? And the cost of making 10 million naira these days is not what it was five years ago. So while I would also encourage that if government puts in policies and, um, and policies in place that will support local manufacturers. They can clearly put in place certain policies to mitigate those of us who tend to um, buy used vehicles. So I agree, we may tend to begin to look at um, you know homegrown vehicles for our com for our commuting, but we need to try as much as possible um, to make those vehicles a lot more durable. Because if you look at um, buying a used vehicle, say Toyota Corolla today, um, a 2012 Corolla or a 2012 Toyota Camry, you can use that vehicle comfortably for another six to ten years um if you if you have good maintenance culture but if you pick up a look a, a brand new um locally manufactured vehicle can you actually use it on nigerian roads um for the next five years and uh, without looking like it's been battered so we we need to put all of this in concentration so that we can begin to encourage home grown um manufactured vehicles so, in your opinion now, would you say that um, government um, policies over the time have not actually encouraged um, local manufacturers of um, vehicles in the country? Um, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that when you begin to look at um, cost of running, cost of business in Nigeria, cost of um, running diesel, um, those are signals that our policies are not getting was encouraging local manufacturing and if you go further to look at the infrastructure the road network um and all the and the connectivity from one point to another and a number of other factors um you see that those are not there all right we still have magnus among on the show we'll take a quick break and return with more do join us again Welcome back. It's still Business Insight and Plus TV Africa. And we still have uh, Magnus Mwong with us. And we are looking at, uh, you know, the NAC, the 15% for, you know, uh, vehicles that have been, that has been imposed. But right now, let's just take it one step further and just uh, do a bit of a critique of uh, the Finance Act and how it has actually helped in uh, revenue generation for uh, the country. Thank you so much, Mwong, for standing by. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's just talk about the Finance Act that, you know, that is uh, actually in force uh, in the country. And uh, Nigeria has over time talked about uh, you know, revenue generation and the, how they can diversify the economy. How would you rate the Finance Act, uh, the recent one, and um, what contribution has it really done to the nation's uh, revenue generation? So before 2020, um, we typically tend to wait for a minimum of five years um, or thereabout before we can make certain legislative changes. But what we see happen with the introduction of the Finance Act is that it's looking like an annual thing. So over the last three years, we've had you know, different amendments to certain legislation um, in the country. And the important role that the Finance Act plays 
um, is that it's issued and it's signed and it's made available to the general public, you know, simultaneously with the budget of the of the federal government for that year. So the Finance Act is geared, it's a mechanism geared towards helping the federal government with its vision to raise the necessary internally generated funds with which it can execute its budget. And over the last three years, it, it's steadily progressed, like we've seen. A number of things have played have been there, and they've encouraged the growth of small businesses in the first Finance Act, um, when it changed um, the threshold of um, um, the categories of small businesses that can pay taxes and those that and, and what needs to be paid. So there's a bit of clarity. It's becoming a lot more flexible. It's becoming a lot more interactive. So if government sees that a certain portion of the legislation is not um, is not yielding its fruits, um, they are able to change it in the following year and make necessary amendments. And the beauty as well is that it's not just government sitting down and designing the Finance Act. Um, you know, the citizenry, key stakeholders, business decision makers, a lot of consultations that go in. So it's citizens like you and I who are pulled together into a group that sit down, discuss, deliberate. There are discussions in various sectors and geopolitical zones of the country to agree as to what makes or what should be in the next, next finance act. So it's a welcome development, um, but we, we're, we're yet to begin to see um, a lot more of this play, especially in the engine room, which is the small and medium businesses. Um, we would like to see a lot more traction with government trying to ensure that those who they require to pay tax or pay certain levies, um, and when they do have certain features or certain infrastructure to keep running their businesses. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we have been speaking with uh, Magnus Omongu, and uh, he has been sharing useful insight in all of these uh, recent um, issues and uh, that have um, generated a controversy. Uh, Magnus is the MD Umwahe Associates. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. All right, it is still Business Insight and Plus TV Africa. I will now leave you with useful tips on how to write an informal proposal. But well, that's the size of the show for this week. I am Justin Akadone. Many thanks for watching. Writing an informal proposal. The thought of writing a proposal overwhelms many people, but the task does not have to be daunting. Informal proposals are written when people need to ask permission to make a purchase, undertake a project, or write a paper. This type of proposal is a way of persuasively putting forth an idea and asking for action to be taken on that idea. When writing a proposal, consider who will read the proposal and what that person may or may not already know about what you're proposing. Follow these steps when writing a proposal. 1. State your purpose. Do this clearly and concisely so that the reader knows immediately why you are writing. 2. Give some background information. Explain why you are proposing your suggestion so that the reader has a better understanding of the problem. 3. State a solution to the problem. This is where you give specifics about your suggestion. 4. Show costs. Lay out any costs that will be involved. 5. Conclusion. Wrap it up by restating the problem and the proposed solution.